I want to welcome you. This is week three of our series on purpose-driven families. And the last couple weeks, Father's Day and then the follow-up to Father's Day, we had eight men on stage talking about being parents. So we thought it might be good to include a mom this weekend. <laughs> Just might, uh, not, might not be a bad idea. So welcome Shondell, who's joining me for this message. And this weekend, we're going to talk together about where do you get the power to do what God has called you to do in your family? What is it that powers your family? What is it that powers your parenting? Now, these things that we're gonna talk about, where you get the power, it, it applies to a business, it applies to a marriage, it applies to a friendship, it applies to every area of life. We're gonna focus in on families this weekend and what powers your parenting. And there are a lot of different things that power our parenting, not always the right thing. Sometimes the wrong thing can power our parenting. Sometimes it's powered by fear. We're afraid of what other people are gonna think. We're afraid of what our parents are gonna think. And that tends to power what we do. Sometimes it's, it's powered by guilt. We're trying to make up for the divorce. And we know we're not supposed to. We, we even know it wasn't our fault, but still, we're trying to make up for something. And so it gets powered by guilt. For a lot of us, Parenting families, they tend to get powered by responsibility. We just end up just doing the right thing because we're supposed to do the right thing for our kids. And that becomes the power behind it all. Anyone who's been a parent for more than five minutes knows that there's a lot of tasks to parenting. When they're, when they're babies, it's bottle fed, diaper changed, a sleeping crib, done for the day. That's it. And then they're 17 years old and it's schoolwork finished, dinner fed, in by curfew, done for the day. You got the tasks done. But parenting isn't just tasks, it's a relationship. But because there are so many tasks, sometimes it starts to get driven by, uh, powered even by the tasks. What is it that powers a family? We all know the answer to that. This isn't anything new we're gonna talk about. It's love. Love is the power that lasts. Love is the power that's enough. So we're gonna talk together in this message about the practical ways that you can plug in to God's love plug into God's power. Because if you're not plugged in, it's not gonna work. I, and one of the things I'm enjoying doing these days is making our home smarter, smart home stuff. And I was putting in a new lamp, and you know, if you've done this, you gotta make all the internet connections and all the hub connections. I made all of those, and the lamp still wouldn't turn on automatically. And finally I looked down and I realized I hadn't like plugged in the lamp, the one final thing. <laughs> so I had a smart home and a dumb owner is what I had. <laughs> when you're, you can do all the tips and tricks to parenting, all the right things, but if you're not plugged into this power, none of it's gonna work. About that sense of responsibility and kind of finishing the task, it has uh, come to my realization that since parenting is a relationship, the relationship doesn't end when the kids are grown. And it's been kind of amazing to me, a slow realization, but particularly this weekend, that um, how, how much time and, and energy and attention and relationship three grown and married children can take. Um, but we're really thrilled. Really Shonda thrilled. was helping one of our kids move until 1030 last night. Now, not me, I was preaching today, so I, I, I couldn't <laughs> help, but, but Shonda was there helping. <laughs> Um, but when we think about what powers our families, we have to come to the stark realization that there is no such thing as a perfect parent or a perfect family member. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect son or daughter when you're caring for aging parents. And we just have to accept that we're not perfect. Man, I'm far from perfect. Even now, looking back, I don't even crystallize or glorify whatever um, those years of parenting. I, I felt like a failure a lot of times, but, but it's very real. I mean, I had to apologize for Luke, to Luke, our youngest, this morning for something that happened, a miscommunication last night. So we gotta realize, my parents weren't perfect, your parents weren't perfect, you're not perfect, and we can all agree that there is no perfect child. Definitely. <laughs> one of the, when you talk about being a failure as a parent, I have lots of examples, but the one that comes to my mind immediately when you talk about failure as a parent was um, our son, Ryan, was about 10, 10 years old. He's our oldest. 
And um, he now is a pastor, but he also got a law degree. And we, we could have called that at two years old. I don't know why we were surprised when he said, I wanna go to law school. So and we were, Ryan and I were having one of our famous discussions. And I am not a logical person, and I'm fueled by emotions. And so this argument, you know, was, was going nowhere. And I was getting more and more um, emotional. And I, I, I finally thought, okay, okay, I'm gonna pull out the big guns. And I threw my hands on the hips. Well, I didn't really think it through, obviously. I threw my hands on my hips and I said, Ryan, you're acting like a child. <laughs> He looks at me and goes, Mama, I am a child. <laughs> but you know, we, we feel like failures. And everybody has opinions for us. You know, psychologists, grandparents, although we would never do that. Um, you will too, just wait, just wait. Everybody has opinions, and sometimes they can be helpful. But sometimes it's really, really hard. And so we have to look at truth. We need more than opinions. We need truth. We need God's truth. And the simple truth at the beginning of thinking about this is that nothing is more important than love. That's right. No matter what we do, the truth we have to remember, when, when you're wondering if what you're doing right as a parent is important, it's that nothing is more important than love. Look at Matthew 19, 14. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to people who are like these children. So I, I wanna say something about that, but I just have to interject. When we were getting dressed for church this weekend, my greatest fear happened when I noticed that what we chose like is sort of matchy. I don't know if you noticed it like sort of, <laughs> this is men's greatest fear. Women, if you don't understand this. I tried to a, warn you. I know, I know you did. And I thought it would be okay, but then I saw us up on the screen. It's really scary looking. I gotta tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> what did that have to do with Jesus and the children? Nothing at all. I just noticed it and I, I had to say it. I just had to say it. So, <laughs> with that in mind, back to our message. <laughs> and I hope you caught the moment here with Jesus and these children. Some of you have read this, but let me just bring you into it for a minute, because it's so important to see what happened here. There's this moment <clears throat> with kids and moms and maybe some dads who decide one day to go and see Jesus. They hear that the holy man, they hear that the, maybe the Messiah, some people say, he's come to their town. And so the moms get up that morning, and they say, kids, we're gonna go see Jesus. So they get their best clothes on, they probably match, so that's where it fits in, their clothes probably match, right, because they're the best clothes. And they're taking all their kids and they're matching clothes to go and see Jesus. And they get closer and closer down the narrow streets, and there's the city square, and they can start to hear the crowd that's there, and they're telling their kids, we're getting closer, we're gonna see Jesus in just a few minutes. And they get closer, they can, they can almost get there, and just before they're there, one of the disciples steps in front of them and says, you can't see Jesus today. Jesus doesn't have any time for children. So those of you that are parents, or any of us would understand this, what it's like in that moment for a child. You've promised them something, and now you're turning back, and you're saying, we're not gonna get to do what I promised you we were gonna do. And maybe some of the kids are starting to cry. They're walking away, and they hear this voice behind them. Don't prevent the children from coming to me. It's the voice of Jesus. He's inviting them into his life because he loves children. And it's out of that love that Jesus Christ has for children that you and I draw all the strength that we need for the kind of families that God wants us to have. The, the heart of Jesus is to love children. So when you talk about what does it mean to be a purpose-driven family, you, you start with the obvious, you stick with the obvious, you never get away from the obvious, you choose to love. You choose to do what Jesus taught us to do. Here in John 13, 34 and 35, there in your outline, Jesus taught, so now, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love from one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So we're to love like Jesus. Love like Jesus reminds me of a heartwarming story. A mom was preparing pancakes for her two sons, Kevin, who's five, and 
Mikey, who was three, and she saw the, uh, the boys began to argue over who was gonna get the first pancake. And so she saw the opportunity to teach a lesson on love. And she said, boys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin sees his opportunity and goes, Mikey, you be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Chandel said, we can't tell that joke. You've told it before. Nobody will laugh. I feel so good right now. I just want you to know this. That was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> if we're going to love like Jesus loved, it has, it has to include the people that are closest to us. It can't just be people that are far away in some other country we're never gonna meet. It has to be our family. It's a lot harder to love our own families. So what we wanna do in this message is just take what we just read, those verses, the, the new commandment that Jesus gave us, and just sort of break it down. What does it say to us about how we bring a new kind of love into our family? Well, number one, how do I love like Jesus? Number one, I need a better example. Jesus, you break it down, Jesus says, just as I loved you, I'm the example. He's the model of love. So when you look at this, here's the principle. And it's not just for parenting, it's everywhere in life. Friendship, marriage, business, school. Here's the principle. I will follow the example that I focus on. I will follow the example that I focus on. So if I got a better example, I'm gonna tend to follow that example. This is just true in life. We all tend to have the kind of marriage that our parents had unless we choose a different example. That's just the way that we naturally drift. If you grew up in a home that displayed a lot of affection, there were a lot of hugs, then that's gonna be what your home is like. If you grew up in a home that it was a very, like once a year maybe there was a hug at, at Christmas, that was the only time after dinner, that was the big hug moment in your family, then you're not gonna have a lot of drift toward a lot of hugs. We tend to follow the example, and it, it's extremely hard to break the power of the example that was set for us. Whether you're running away from a bad example or you're running towards a good example, it's hard to break the power of that example. And this principle has deep implications for our parenting because as parents, we tend to raise our kids the way we were raised. Some of you grew up in a really quiet home. A fly on the wall was a major event at dinner. <laughs> some, some of you grew up in a really loud home where a 787 plane could land and it would really disrupt your conversation. Have you ever heard your parents in your words or interactions with another family member? You, you, you just tend to drift toward that. Like that's, that's the power of example. So here's the big question. What if you grew up with a bad example? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, for all of us, we grew up with some bad examples. There's no such thing as a perfect family, perfect parents, perfect children. All of us had some bad examples, but some of you, you had a terribly broken example in growing up. So what if you grew up with that? I just wanna share with you, it is not enough to just want to break a bad pattern. In fact, the trying to break a bad pattern can often cause you to get back into that bad pattern strange how we're wired as human beings. You gotta have something different. In order to change the way you love, you gotta find a new pattern. And Jesus says, I'm offering it to you. Here's my new commandment, and here's my model, just like I loved you. Uh, Jesus gave us a new commandment because a new commitment is not enough. We need, we need a new model. The magnet of those models is just super strong, and it just keeps pulling you back to the, the, the habits that you have have seen given to you, but you need a new and a stronger magnet. And Jesus offers that to us. The, the key is, if, if there's anything we're praying for you this weekend, it's that you could stop trying so hard in your families and start trusting. Yeah. And looking at the example, the, the new commandment that Jesus gives us and his power to, par to parent and, and be in our families together. So look, look at what Paul had to say about this when it comes to our example. He talked about Jesus' example and then our example in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, when he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, Paul knew he wasn't perfect. He knew he wasn't Jesus. He wasn't the perfect example. But he's saying, at least I'm trying to follow Christ, and it's this game of follow the leader. You follow me because I'm following Christ. So you find somebody who's trying to follow Christ, and that's the person who you follow. So as a parent and a family, if I'm trying to follow Christ, that's my model, then my kids are gonna be drawn into that example. And, and the truth behind this is, you're never gonna erase the example of the home that you grew up in. That's impossible. 
But you can replace your responses to your circumstances with the example of Christ. Instead of just following or fleeing from an example that you had in the past, you got this new commandment, you got this new example, you got Jesus Christ. Now God knows you're not gonna be perfect at the example of following Jesus. So don't get the guilt trip going already, all right? I can see it going in some of your eyes. But instead, just recognize every step that I take in following his example is a good step that's gonna be reflected in my family. Jesus taught us to do this. Jesus says in John 13 to 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. This is the night before he died in the upper room. He's with his disciples. And you might remember when this happened. The disciples had come into the room and nobody had washed anybody's feet. That's what always happened because the streets were dirty so people washed each other's feet. But they were too proud to do it and so nobody would do it. And Jesus walks in, everybody's feet are dirty. It's a room of dirty feet and proud hearts. He sees it. So what does Jesus do? He washes their feet. The master washes their feet. The Messiah washes their feet. And after he washes their feet, he says, you should do as I have done for you. Now, some of you may have been in churches or heard that sometimes we do like foot washing ceremonies in churches, like they're this religious thing. That's not what was happening here. By the way, I don't really like those foot washing ceremonies. I mean, some, some of you might love them. I actually hate them. You know, I hate them. Three reasons, stinky feet, ugly toenails. I mean, oh man, you don't want to see my toenails up close. You just don't, you don't. And people giggle sometimes, which is really bad. It's uncool. Because it tickles. Well, it's just not cool in church, you know. So... <laughs> The reason they first did this was not some super spiritual religious ceremony. It's because feet were dirty. And so they got washed. And Jesus says, when you see somebody who has dirty feet, wash them. And you've just done as I've done for you. That's loving like Jesus loves. So you think through, who is it that can't wash their feet today? Well, the elderly sometimes, disabled, but also babies. So when you're washing your baby's feet, now I know they got cute toenails, so it's a good time to do it. But when you're washing your baby's feet, you're doing as Jesus has done for you. When you're washing your baby's bottom, you're doing as Jesus has done for you. Those small acts of love done in Jesus' name. When you're thinking through, Jesus, thank you for the privilege of letting me do this. That's one of the most powerful things that you can do. You're following his model. Now, with each of these, we wanna just give you a practical step. Something practical you can do to follow the model of Jesus is look at the model of Jesus. You cannot follow what you can't see. So in your family, as a parent, my encouragement is spend at least five minutes a day looking at two or three verses in the scripture because that's where you see what Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Now, I know, you got preschoolers. You don't have time to do that. Just five minutes, two or three verses. It's gonna make the most powerful impact because if, if they're gonna follow your example of following Christ, you gotta see him. And the only way to see him is to spend time with him. And you think, if I can't spend an hour, I haven't spent time with him. Let me tell you, from experience, three to five minutes can make all the difference in your life. A few verses a day can make all the difference in your life when you're following this better example. So we need a better example. And number two, we need a stronger foundation. I need a stronger foundation. Jesus said, I have loved you. The greatest experience in your life is when you really, truly, truly recognize and accept and take into your heart, Jesus loves me. The greatest experience you can have every single day of your life is when you stop, like Tom was talking about, and talk to him and say, I recognize you love me. Jesus loves me. We have a two-year-old granddaughter, Amaya, and she loves to sing, Jesus Loves Me. We've sung it to her all her life, and it is extremely precious when she sings it along with us. Um, it totally resets my day when I remember. In fact, um, after the services last night, she was out on the hill, and, and our daughter Alyssa took her a video of, because she'd been in the service, of her singing it. I wouldn't have posted on the screen, but Tom said we don't have time. Um, <laughs> Why do we sing this? Because it's a cute little Sunday school song? No, because the most important thing about Amaya is that Jesus loves her. And it is my constant prayer that Reese, Anna, Kate, Dottie, Amaya, and Gabe, our six grandchildren, know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus 
loves them. It is the foundation for their lives. Nothing else is going to give them the security, the confidence, the, the joy, the peace, all of those things, but the fact that Jesus loves them and that nothing can take that love away. Once you see that reality or come back to that reality, guys, it's not like we get it once, you know. It just, I mean, I can't believe how many times a day, even if I have had my time with God during, in the morning, but that I have to come back to this truth and go, it's all about you, God, and it's because I'm secure because you love me. And once you see that, it, it affects all of your relationships, all of them. Write this down. I will give love as I have received love. You cannot give love unless you've received it. Don't make the mistake of trying to love out of an empty account. Remember the truth that God will never love you more or less than he loves you right now because of what Jesus did on the cross. You do not have to earn his love. It is absolutely secure. So the stronger foundation is the foundation of God's unconditional love. If you think God loves you on your good days, but not so much on your bad days, you don't know how powerfully God loves right. you. Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. We've come back to this a couple of times in this series because it's such an important principle for purpose-driven families, for families that work, for families that love, is knowing that God's love is never gonna be taken away from us. If you know Christ, and you feel condemned, this verse is saying, that's not God. That's right. you, you feel condemned because of something that's inside of you. Feeling condemned is one of the big signs that you're building on the wrong foundation. The opinions of others condemn us. Sometimes our own opinion of ourselves condemns us, but God does not condemn us. Now, no condemnation does not mean no consequences for the wrong things that we do. Of course we have consequences, but it does mean that God is not angry with us. It does mean that God will not punish us. It does mean that God will not reject us. God says, you're never gonna have to leave my table. I never condemn you. That's not a bad model for our families. That's the foundation that we build on. One of my favorite verses about God's love is John 15, nine. It's there in your outline. I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love, at home in my love. I just picture crawling up on the couch with Jesus, taking my shoes off, getting a warm blanket, being at home in the fact of his love. But it might be that I'm in, in a line in a grocery store when I'm really hurried and frazzled and I've got 12 other things to do that day and all of a sudden this verse will come back, make yourself at home in my love. So it could be in the quiet moments, but also in the busy moments. Here's the thing. Things are a lot better at home when we're at home in his love. Look at Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. As dearly loved children, the best thing you can do in, in loving your children or loving your um, parents or loving your other family members is to realize that you love because you are a dearly loved child yourself. Never, never, never get over that fact. Want to be a great parent, a great son or daughter, a great aunt or uncle? Realize how deeply God loves you. Commit to a relationship with Christ. Maybe you've never really truly experienced his love, but experience that and then live in that relationship of love, of unconditional love every single day. So just a practical step. For those of you who struggle, <clears throat> I think it's 90% of us at least, with feeling loved by God, Maybe we just need to write down these verses um, on some cards and, and put them beside your bed. Or my favorites, actually these verses, the verses from Romans um, 8, 35 to 39 that talk about God's unconditional love and how it can never be taken away are on my bathroom mirror and more importantly, on my refrigerator. 
<laughs> you need to, so maybe that's just a practical thing you can do. Remember, put those verses in front of you all day long. So to love like Jesus, you gotta have a better example. You gotta have a stronger foundation. And then number three, I need a higher purpose. I, I need a higher purpose. Jesus says the reason you're gonna love each other is your love will prove to the world that you're my disciples. In, in most love songs and in most movies, the highest purpose of love is love itself. Jesus says, I've got a higher purpose than even love itself. My purpose is you're gonna get to show the world that you belong to me. You're gonna get to show the world that you're my disciples, what I'm like. Love has to have a purpose higher than itself. God created us, yes, to love, and love's gonna last longer than anything else, but our love shows the world what he's like. And so, you might write this down. Since love has to have a purpose higher than itself, parenting has to have a purpose higher than itself. The purpose of parenting is not to be a good parent so my kids can be good parents, so their kids can be good parents. What, what, what's the purpose beyond parenting? What's the purpose beyond our families? The purpose is that the world can see whose we are. The purpose is that, well, look at this next verse, Psalm 115, verse one. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. So I know, this is a big church sound and term, but the purpose is glory to God. Now what does that mean? I mean, we sing it you know, sometimes in church, we sing it a lot at Christmas. What, what does glory to God mean? Glory means when you see God for who he really is. And the amazing thing is, this, this, this might blow your mind, God wants to let the world see who he really is through your life, and even through your family. I know, you're not perfect. I, I know, we stumble a lot. But I also know there are these moments when we're trusting in his love and we're sharing his love with the world, with our families, and God is glorified in that. People get to see what he's like in that. One of the keys to having a strong family is to realize that God not only wants to work in your family, he wants to work through your family to show the world what he's like, to show the world who he is. That's who God is. And one of the great verses, most familiar verses on parenting in all the Bible, parents and children, is Psalm 127, verse three. It's a short verse, so let's read it together. Children, children are a are gift from, from the, the Lord. Lord. Now, depending on the day, you read that verse in a different way. Some days it's, children are a gift from the Lord. Some days it's, children are a gift from the Lord. I'm trusting you, God. <laughs> I actually love that verse because deep down, I love being a dad. I, uh, I love being a dad, grateful to be a dad. The two most spiritually discouraging times in my life were revolved around this thing of being a dad. Chantal and I, when we were first married, tried to have kids and weren't able to. Tried and tried, years went by, and finally we went to the doctors and the doctors told us we weren't gonna be able to have kids. And the discouragement. We had this dream, we had this heart to have kids, to be parents, and to think that that was never gonna happen was deeply discouraging. Now God answers the prayer to have kids in a lot of different ways, sometimes through adoption, sometimes through medical procedures, miracles, sometimes through being involved with other kids and families. In our case, by God's grace, he did give us three children. We're very, very grateful for what God gave. The second discouraging time was when our oldest, Ryan, was heading off to college. Some of you are facing this this summer. Your oldest in your, in your family is getting ready to head off to college. And you're thinking, our family's gonna change. It's never gonna be the same. That's what I was thinking, so I was, I was discouraged. And I wish I could say to you I was totally wrong, but I, I wasn't wrong. Our family did change. It had to change. Of course it has to change. They need to launch out. They need to become what God has called them to become. But I, I loved it when we were all together. I knew that was gonna be lost, and I had to grieve that. Some of you have to grieve that this summer. Just need to have permission to grieve that in the midst of celebrating them going off because that's a time of, of spiritual discouragement. It all comes out of this thing of children being a gift. During that time of discouragement when Ryan was heading off, I had to remember the last part of the verse, from the Lord. He's the one who sent our kids into our lives. He's the one who has a plan and purpose for their lives. We say around here a lot, it's not about me. Well, in my parenting, it's not about me, it's not about them. For all of us, it's, it's all about the Lord. For me, this purpose thing goes back to um, the decision to even have children. Uh, when we were in college and before we were engaged, I was thinking about this and, you know, I wanted kids, but I thought, but why have kids? 
You know, what's the purpose behind it? Because it was the late 70s and, and you know, the population explosion was a big topic and so was the crisis in the world, but our world's always in crisis. And you know, people say, how could you bring a child into this world kind of thing? But we were also in a discipleship class at the same time and all of a sudden it was just like a light bulb came on for me that parenting can be the ultimate discipleship experience where you take a child from the very beginning and get to mold and shape them and teach them to know and love God and to serve him and to have know his purposes for their lives. Galatians 4.19 talks about this. It's on the screen. But oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Now, I'm not really sure what the Apostle Paul knew about labor pains, but... Um, <laughs> I was there for the birth of all three of our kids, and it looked like it really hurt. I just, I just gotta tell you, I, maybe he knew that. <laughs> Um, sometimes working with our children for Christ to be, be developed in their lives, I think you'll agree with me, is very, very painful. And it is like labor and delivery. Um, so to pick up our story from what Tom was saying, um, we did eventually get pregnant. And we thought it was kind of like our one shot that we were going to have one child. And at 11 weeks, I had a miscarriage. And we were just devastated. Um, that was part of, of his discouragement at that time, too, for both of us, obviously. And um, it, was, it was just hard to figure out what God was doing. The story of Hannah became very important to me at that time in our lives. And I actually, the verse that's on there on your outline, 1 Samuel 1, 27 and 28, hung over our oldest son's bed for um, a very long time actually way too long, but um, <laughs> for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him, so I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And what does that mean, dedicated to the Lord? It's like just Tom said, it's not about me. It's not about our kids. It's not about you know my parenting. It's about God. And, and so we, God gives us these children as gifts and we give them back. At Saddleback here, we have just a real practical, um, fun and meaningful way to acknowledge that fact of dedication. We have a dedication ceremony and it's for parents to be able to, to say, I'm gonna dedicate this child to the Lord. I, I, I want this child to live for God's purposes and there's a purpose in my parenting and that's to help them to know God. And it may be for a child that's two months old or 15. So um, you can connect with um, Saddleback Kids to find out when the next one is going to be. But it's a, it's a really great time for your whole family to kind of celebrate this dedication of children. All right, there's a fourth thing in what Jesus taught us is a new commandment. That twice he said, love each other. But behind loving each other, what he's heading toward in this whole commandment is, I need a greater power. If I'm gonna do that, truly love like Jesus loves, truly love each other, I need a great, greater power. Because we, we know that this kind of talk of like loving like Jesus loves in your home, we know how discouraging it can be on one level. Some of you, you say, look, my biggest battle it's just getting them out the door in, in the morning. And now, now you're saying, love like Jesus? I mean, if I could just get them out the door on time, that would be the greatest thing in the world. I mean, my house is like this racetrack through the halls, garbage dump in their rooms, and now you're saying it's gotta be like this holy sanctuary of loving like Jesus, and oh, <laughs> and that's gonna be our home. I just don't see it, you're saying to yourself. And we wanna say to you, God is not looking to do something fake and phony in 1950s in your family. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real love in real families who make real mistakes but have real hope because of God's love, God's real love. And how does that make its way into your home? That's what we're talking how about. How do I get to that reality? You just love, genuine love in the reality of life. So when you yell at your kids in the morning and then apologize to them in the evening when they get home from school or you get home from work, that teaches them a lot more than a seminary class on forgiveness. And when you decide to give up a, a weekly activity, maybe a golf game or a, a, an outing with friends or something, because your neighbor needs some help and they see that, 
That's more than a lot of Sunday school classes. Or when you hold a baby, just to hold it, just to express love, just to help them feel secure, that develops more security than so many other classes could. Or Bible studies. How do you get there? You need greater love for a greater purpose. Because <laughs> if you're like me, you struggle with being selfish. But we just have to go back to his love. Because it, it's in his love that we will find the power to live in the promise of his love. 1 John 4, 19, just kind of saying the same thing again. We love because he first loved us. In fact, let's say that together because it's such a great verse. We, we love, love because, because he, he first loved, loved us. us. Start with his love for you. You're not on your own. Look to his power. And how do we do that? We, we learn more and more and more about his love for us. And that in, in gives us the power that we need. This is true in our children's and youth programs here at Saddleback. We are so, so, so grateful. When we moved here, we had a seven-year-old, a three-and-a-half-year-old, and then Luke, our youngest, was born after we came to Saddleback. And we just look and shake our heads in awe at what God has done through Saddleback Kids, through the junior high program, through high school, and through college. The, the people that have poured into our children has made a difference in the love, and they've partnered with us in this power and promise of God's love in the lives of our kids. And we're grateful for our children's youth programs. I know a lot of you are grateful. It's not a bad time just to say thank you. Let's just say thank you to all our workers, what they do. We appreciate you guys, <laughs> the difference you make. All right, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ because he gives me strength. So that's where the power comes from, through Christ. Now you might be thinking, I know Christ can do all things, but I got a really messed up family, so I'm wondering about this one. Well, have you read the Bible and looked at the families in the Bible and how God worked through messed up families? There was one point in history where God reduced everything down to like the very best family. Maybe you think you've got the best family on earth. Well, this is where God chose. You know, the very, is the early version of Survivor. Very best family, just one left on earth. Remember the family? Yeah, Noah, Noah's family. Noah's family was messed up, even though it was the very best family. I mean, they, they, they get off the ark, Noah's drunk, naked in his tent, this isn't going well, he has to curse one of his kids. Even the very best family was messed up. So if you feel like you're the best family and nobody really knows that you're also messed up, you're a Noah family. And guess what? <laughs> God wants to work in your family. Then there's the Jacob and Esau family. You know, Isaac and all those guys. I mean, they started fighting when they were being born. They were fighting every day of their lives. Everybody knew they were a messed up family. And guess what? Through that family, through that family, God brought the line of Jesus into this world. I wouldn't have done it that way. But when you think about it, what other way could he have done it? All he's got is messed up families to work with because we're all messed up in one way or the other. And God works in messed up families. Yes. What makes the difference is love. With it, you have hope. Without it, you got nothing. That's what the Bible says in some of the most famous verses about this. 1 Corinthians 13. Let me put those verses up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13, one to three. And it'll take a couple minutes. Let's read these verses together. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Nothing. Now, th these verses, you might, if you've been to a few weddings, you might know they're often read at weddings. I, I think they should also be read in hospital delivery rooms because they fit with every one of our families. So I, I, I wrote up a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 13 for families, for parents. If I speak to my children with the patience of a saint and the wisdom of a prophet, yet have not love, I'm only a loud toy drum. If I read all the best parenting books but have no love, it means nothing. 
If I sacrifice my financial future for my children, but have not love, I give them nothing at all. But on the other hand, if I say the wrong thing at the wrong time to my child out of my tiredness, yet still have love, God is working through me as a parent. When all I see is my lack of gifts and knowledge, and yet I still have love, God is working through me as a parent. Mm -hmm. On those days when it feels like I've got nothing left to give, and yet I still have love, God is working through me as a parent. Let's pray together. Some of you, when we talk about you can't give what you haven't received, you're not sure you've received the gift of Jesus' love. Well, be sure. He's holding it out to you. You don't have to do anything to earn it or to buy it. He already did all of that. He died on the cross. So he's saying, I'm offering you my forgiveness. I'm offering you my life. Would you say to Jesus right now, I accept your gift. I accept your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of new life. All of us, I want to encourage us just to pray this simple prayer. Father, I want to grow in love. And I start with your love for me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for being faithful to me. I am making a fresh commitment to focus on your love. And I'm praying that out of that, my love for others will strengthen. My love for others will deepen. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. -day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.